Good evening. I'm Lori Rappashat. I'm the new executive director, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to the Lagura Center. As usual, we start with some housekeeping items. If you have not yet turned off your cell phone, now would be an excellent time to do so. I also want to be able to thank the many of you who are contributors to our annual fund. That helps us keep our year-round programming here at LaGrua up and viable so we can do events like this. However, our contributors don't cover all of our costs, so we do ask you to consider putting something in our donation box on your way out. It's uh, we can conveniently placed it there. We need it, we ask for it, and God knows we appreciate it. So welcome to Borough Vision 2020 Part 2. Are you hearing me okay? Yes. Yeah, there we go. Um, when the Lagrua Center was started some nine years ago, this sort of community gathering was certainly envisioned by our founders as precisely the sort of thing they wanted to encourage in this space, a place where an engaged citizenry gets together to talk about things that will strengthen the place where they live and or work. This is the second of what was envisioned as a series of discussions on the Stonington Borough. Uh, the first one happened in June. I think a number of you came to that event. And if you didn't, or even if you did, you have a nice document that recaps it for you. We have conv again convened a, a panel of community leaders to talk about what's on their mind, and then we will hear from you. So please be thinking about any questions or comments you may have. We will again start with the Town of Stonington's Director of Planning, who will moderate the discussion. So please, let's welcome Jason Vincent. Thank you, Laurie. Thank you all for coming out this evening. We had a lot of competition just looking outside. Uh, there's plenty of other things to do with the weather. Uh, so we appreciate that you took the time and that you cared to come here. Prior to starting the meeting, uh, I was speaking with uh, Jeff Callahan about places that people love. And I mentioned that just walking around to the audience and listening to people as they came in, um, I think that one of the reasons that I heard from you, both this last meet, this meeting and the last meeting, was that we love our community. And I heard that word quite a bit when describing the place that you live, work, and play. So thank you for that. We're going to have a, a panel discussion with the three panelists, but I wanted to ask, uh, really show of hands real quick, how many people were here at the June uh, workshop? Okay, great. So thank you for coming back. And to those that are new, thank you for coming as well. Uh, hopefully on your way in, you received a copy of the Borough Vision Summary from that meeting, and I will help orient you to some of the things that were discussed. Uh, what we discussed uh, was trying to, what we're working on is to try to develop some tactical strategy, you know, some tactical elements that we could be working on as a, as a village to address some of the issues that are here. And uh, as part of any plan, you do an inventory, you assess the, the elements of the inventory, and then you develop strategies. Uh, that first meeting was to, uh, to conduct that inventory from the public to try to get uh, some framework of those issues and ideas. Uh, we're looking to come back and, and pick at that a little bit more this evening. But before we do, we're going to have uh, the panelists talk and, and frame some of the things that uh, have happened in the meantime. So we'll start off with uh, Jeff Callahan. It appears that maybe half of you are here for the June uh, session, so I'm going to hopefully summarize uh, what I said then and uh, uh, reiterate it uh, so that people who weren't here can, can uh, start off on the same basis as, as all the others. Um, back in June when we had the first session, I pointed out that uh, of all the elements of community life here in the borough, the only one that is absolutely necessary in order for the borough to be a separate municipality is in fact the borough government. And if we don't have a borough government, we don't have our own separate municipality. I guess it's obvious, but uh, it's, it's a key point. Um, now I also pointed out that the government we have is becoming increasingly fragile uh, because of the uh, various factors which uh, which I'll discuss as we go on. Why is this happening? Why, why are fewer and fewer people participating in, in rural government? Uh, uh, there are probably a number of 
factors, but a key one, obviously, is the declining population. And, uh, I guess we, do we have that figure? No. Uh, this, uh, there's a graph I did in the last session that shows, yeah, there it is, that uh, in, in a little over a century, the, the population of the borough has gone from something over 2,300 to today, 914. Now that's that's the census count. Of course, it doesn't mean there's only 914 souls here, but it does mean those are the number of people. That's the number of people who claim this as their official residence. So that that clearly uh, impacts the the ability to to staff all the all the boards and committees and so forth that it takes to run the borough government. Uh, I also talked about the history of the borough a little bit. I just want to reiterate two points. One is that we are the oldest borough in the state of Connecticut, uh, having been in business now for 215 years. And the other point is that um, there are only uh, there were 26 boroughs at sort of the height of the borough movement, if you will, back in the early 20th century, and there are now uh, eight or nine, depending on certain ones or whether they're counted or not. So, so the, the population of boroughs has gone down, the number of boroughs has gone down quite a bit uh, over that same period. Most of them have been uh, consolidated with the surrounding town that they're in. And from there, I want to talk about the functions of the borough government. There are four primary functions. And first and foremost is, is the fire protection. Uh, it's one of the reasons why the borough was formed in the first place. Uh, a few months ago, I went, I went through uh, the, the old minutes of the borough. I actually wanted to transfer them to uh, to the historical society where they'd be better taken care of. They were it was just a steel locker in Borough Hall, and uh, it turns out that the earliest ones I could find were from 19, 1837. So I called the historical society and said, uh, "Do you happen to already have the first volume from 1801 to 1837?" Oh no, that was probably lost in the Great Fire. I said, Great Fire? Oh yes. It turns out in, in May of 1837, there was a huge fire. And it was focused in this Cannon Square area, which for those of you who don't realize it, that used to be the center of, of the village, was around Cannon, was now Cannon Square. And so I opened the, uh, the, the oldest set I had, and I looked in the minutes from, uh, I guess it was, it was the next month, June of 1837, and one of the first actions of the board was to allocate hundred dollars to buy more leather buckets for the fire brigade. <laughs> so uh, there's a the government action right there. Um, and I mentioned that our fire department, the borough fire department, is the only municipal department in the town. Most all the other ones, all the other five, are in fire districts, and they have a separate taxing authority. Whereas the borough fire department is paid for out of the taxes that we collect as yes, the borough tax. Second to the function of uh, borough government is maintaining the streets, and that includes uh, repairing, plowing, uh, sweeping, the drainage, and signs, and, and so forth. And uh, I think everybody here knows Sue and Roger, and those, those same two folks have been doing this for, together for a number of years. And they're also the ones that take care of the parks, and uh, you know, when somebody's car needs to be moved, they, they knock on the door and get it moved. So they, they really are kind of vital to the, uh, to the life in, in the borough. Uh, the third function of borough government is, is the uh, regulatory bodies that we have, the Harbor Management Commission, which is a joint commission of the town, planning and zoning, and the zoning board of appeals. And those functions are carried out mainly by volunteers with some professional staff assistance. And the fourth function, of course, is the uh, sort of uh, banal work that we have to do to keep the higher levels of government happy, reporting to Hartford, reporting to uh, Washington, and so forth, paying the bills, um, responding to lawsuits occasionally, and, uh, maintain, and maintaining our buildings, of which we have two. And <clears throat> so how is the federal government structured? It's, it's basically structured the way it was in 1801. Uh, a warden, six purchases, a clerk treasurer, tax collector, and all these positions we still, still have. So for 215 years, through numerous changes in the charter and, and uh, other vagaries of life, uh, the, the government has continued to work with 
more or less the same way it did uh, all those years ago. And it does work as long as there are enough people who can participate and are willing to participate in, in having a government. And that's the heart of the problem. Uh, as the pool of, of the available people shrinks, uh, it becomes harder and harder to staff uh, planning, zoning, ZBA, and so forth. And like every other municipality in the state, regardless of size, we have to meet the same regulatory requirements for FEMA, OSHA, uh, uh, DEEP, uh, ADA, and so forth. In fact, since I gave this uh, talk two months ago, I've become aware of yet another federal agency, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Statistics uh, Service, excuse me, and they want us to update our, our uh, web, their website with our employees to make sure that we're being fair to our employees and paying our fair uh, uh, withholding taxes and so forth. And many of these regulations for these agencies are, are quite technical and, uh, and they require very special expertise to, to comply with. So what do we do about all this? And as I said at the last meeting, I think there are three options. The first option, uh, which is always an option, is to do nothing and just hope that things uh, continue rolling along as they have. Uh, the second option uh, is to revise the borough charter, which hasn't really gone through a major revision in probably 60 years, uh, and see if there's some way to make it make the government more streamlined, more efficient, and, uh, and better able to cope with 21st century realities. The third one is is in fact, dissolving the borough and consolidating uh, the borough with, with the surrounding town. And as my right-hand man, Nick Keppel, has pointed out to me, the borough attorney back there, uh, I've, been, I've been using these terms rather uh, carelessly. It turns out that uh, dissolving the borough, because we were established by the state legislature in 1801, would require an act of the state legislature. On the other hand, we can consolidate the borough with the town, correct me if I'm getting it wrong here, uh, and combined services and so forth. And there's there's a number of, uh, of different flavors of doing this. So it's not just like there's one one precise way to do this. But it would it would represent a fundamental change in, in the way we do business around here. And at the meeting, some of you who are here may recall that somebody had a fourth option, which was to actually expand the borough, do a land grab and something areas around us and, uh, and uh, increase our population that way. <clears throat> so all of these options involve risk, uh, and the last three, uh, including the fourth option that was presented, would uh, require a fair amount of work. I, mean, you just can't, I just can't take the keys to the hall and hand it to rock someone and say, here, take over. There's uh, uh, state statutes lay out a very uh, rigorous process for either revising the charter or for uh, consolidating with the town. So that we have to form yet another committee to, uh, to do all that. Um, but I, as I said last, last, uh, at the last meeting, I think the most riskiest uh, approach really is, is to sort of whistle past the graveyard, assume everything's going to be okay and do nothing. Uh, I don't think that's going to work. So we, we need to take some sort of action. Um, you may recall, if you were here last uh, last month or back in June, that I mentioned that uh, uh, I had noticed similarities between our uh, dilemma here in Stonington and, and Venice, Italy, because we're both uh, facing declining populations and uh, aging populations and rising sea level, and I proposed forming a committee that would look into all this, <coughs> which would, of course require several trips to Venice. Uh, and I also uh, put out a call for members of people who were interested in joining playing zoning or uh, zoning board of appeals. I had two people talking about that. I had dozens talking about Venice. So <laughs> I have all the volunteers I need for that. that um, I, I'm, I'm going to stop now. But one, one other thing I thought I'd mention while I had uh, a number of people in, the, in, in front of me here. Um, the police reports have indicated this year, this, this summer, that there has been a lot more criminal activity in the borough. Uh, you know, relatively minor stuff, some break-ins and that kind of stuff, but annoying and, and troublesome. And 
Let me say this is separate from the Pokemon thing. This is, this is actual criminal activity. So I just want to remind everybody to be a little cautious, uh, lock doors, lock your cars, and so forth. I don't assume that nothing's going to happen. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you for framing some of the issues that we're going to go through. Uh, Spike Bob will now come up and talk to you about some of the things that the nonprofit sector in the boroughs are uh, dealing with. Thanks very much. It's a pleasure to come back. I was asked to speak about nonprofits last time, so I'm just going to give a summary of what I spoke about uh, back in June. You know, it's really hard to imagine life in the borough without nonprofits, from the farmer's market to historical society, to the Como, to the great organizations that are outside the borough, the Mystic Seaport, the Aquarium, that influence life here. And where would we be tonight without the group? So it's so hard to uh, think, and thank you very much for hosting us tonight as a nonprofit. So I made three points the last meeting. The first point, the number of the nonprofits in Stonington and Stonington Borough is surprising, and it's growing. The estimated number of MPOs in Stonington is 160 organizations, and in the borough, 30. Now, these exclude personal private foundations, but they span so many different services from education, history, religious, entertainment, recreation. The revenue growth of these nonprofits have been 11.5%. Uh, from 2010 to 2014, based on reading of the 990s. So they have been growing and doing well. The interesting data is that Stonington has 4.32 public charities per 1,000 persons in 2014, and Fairfield County has just over three. So what seems to be happening in Stonington is caring people are forming organizations for largely social good to fill gaps. And I think that makes our community very special. The second point I made, NBO's nonprofits have a significant impact on borough life. Estimated they account for about 10% of unemployment, huge opportunities in terms of volunteers. Certainly for me, I'm a full-time volunteer because I couldn't get a real job. So, you know, influences our family life. Services, education, entertainment, the whole span. And really social. Many community connections are made through these nonprofits, like the Wadawana Club, Stony Harbor Yacht Club, religious organizations. It's, it, the social component is very important. Tourism, making, giving other people another reason to visit Stonington. Funding, clearly, attracting additional grant dollars, which we did here at La Grua, uh, to support the borough and building it. And then reputation. These nonprofits, I believe, help the fact that the borough is a, a very good and quality place to live. Um, the third point I made back in June is looking to 2020. Collaboration with these nonprofits are going to be critical success, most importantly, survival and improving our community. There's a crowding out factor. Jeff mentioned that no one is signing up for some of the, some of the leadership jobs in our political system, and nonprofits, they're growing, and there, there are many people serving on those boards, et cetera. So there is, there is a crowding out, and at the same time, crowding out for the same dollars. So I think it's really important. I had a little cartoon that I've used a bunch of times, but if you imagine two nonprofits arguing over one slice of pizza, you know, tugging it back and forth, et cetera, really, we have to grow the whole pie. Because if we grow the whole pie, the single slice is going to be irrelevant. More than enough is going to be able to go around. So in terms of looking to the future, demonstrating, if, in, demonstrating the nonprofits can work together on shared issues like how do we manage our insurance? How do we manage our back office? Getting a dialogue around that is going to be very important. Col uh, nonprofits collaborating with other nonprofits to develop joint programming. It's going to be very important for funding. The more that we can collaborate, and certainly um, many of you know that our president of Ness, the collaboration that we have with organizations like the Denison Nature Center, the Seaport, and other organizations is really, really important. So we have to collaborate as a way to grow. So I believe in 2020, these collaborations are going to be very important. So three points. The number of nonprofits is very interesting, growing in Stonington, significant role in our daily lives, and for the future, we have to collaborate. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Spike. And thank you. I, I'm guessing that most of you here uh, contribute to nonprofits in some way. So, thank you on behalf of those nonprofits. Without them, uh, we'd have to find some other gap to fill the service void that they're providing. Uh, our next speaker will represent the business community. It'll be Sage Williams. And Sage, please come on. Join us. Thank you, Jeff. Jason's ever in the 
Kate Williams, and my mother and I have the Lagrua store on Water Street. Um, I'm going to the cards. I would like to take this opportunity to thank all of our local shoppers. We cannot exist without you. You are the heart of our business. The Small Business and Merchant Association has recently begun advertising on NPR, and we have had very positive feedback. Uh, so much, in fact, that the SBMA is looking to continue this advertising through December. What the merchants would love to see is a busy borough throughout the year. Although we are currently in our busy season and the streets are filled and um, everyone's very happy and they love the village, it would be wonderful to come up with ways to draw people to the borough January through May. The SBMA has begun Borough Bag Day, which is a fun day full of sales that we hold in the fall. And the village stroll in December has become a lovely holiday tradition for countless families. I personally think, though quite cold, there is nothing more beautiful than our town and harbor during the winter months. It would be wonderful to share. Uh, for example, Newport holds a chili fest in February. Normally, I would not go to Newport, and I do not miss the chili fest, and it's freezing. Um, Mystic holds a chowder fest. Um, so my ask of you is, for you to help come up with some fun, similar ways to re-energize the borough in winter. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Sage. Uh, so we're going to transition from the, that presentation portion to uh, public participation component. Uh, to, as part of that, I'm going to move over to the Swifty Pack. We're going to have a hard adjourn here this evening at 7 o'clock, that's okay with all of you. So, um, my contact information is up here, that if you are not able to participate, uh, please make sure to communicate with us uh, prior to the end of the after the meeting. Yes, Warden uh, Callahan mentioned the borough governance is an issue of concern and how might, might we move forward. So as we were looking at that issue and trying to think about solutions and strategies that we might have, uh, he framed some of the different types of alternatives that are out there. There's a range of spectrum. Uh, each, each idea has a spectrum of choices, if you will. So you do nothing, there's uh, dissolution or consolidation, whatever it may be. One, one of the things that we wanted to understand from you all was why, what, what is, are the reasons for the borough from your perspective? You know, Jeff, Jeff framed the ones from the governance side of the equation, but what are the reasons? So I'm going to do, uh, I have three questions that I want to ask you. If you could raise your hand and you can answer all three, if that, that means something to you. And then if there's any other reasons, we'd love to hear those as well. So the first one is uh, local governments and public safety. And these are things regarding zoning, fire, uh, general, government man general government management. Is that one of the reasons that you support or think that there's a need for the borough? Is that something that resonates with you as borough residents? Okay, thank you. The second item was uh, public works and infrastructure, sidewalks, park maintenance, uh, things of that nature. Is that a reason that you think it's important to have the borough in, in the government structure? Okay. And the, the last question that I had was branding and identity, being able to be associated with the place, being able to use uh, the language of, I live in the borough. Is that something that you value as a resident? All right, so uh, during that process, I, I would say uh, we didn't get everybody to participate. Maybe we did, but it looked like there were some that weren't. What other reasons do you have that uh, you think retaining the borough is important? Yes. Well, because I know the people who are on the board and I trust them. Yeah, so, so being. Therefore, if we give, if we give other places our, on the board, we don't really know them. Yeah, so it's the access to the officials. Okay, I'll write that. If yeah, there's somebody else, is there any other reasons that we may not have? Yes. I'm very new to the so I don't know. The first thing that crosses my mind, I would be afraid to lose his character. That they would lose the feel that they would say that attracts us all to the borough in terms of the downtown books. Yeah. So the, the attributes that make the borough attractive, being able to have control of those attributes is something you value, is that safety? 
I think the quality of life is very important to all of us, and I would relate that to zoning, which I think is worthy of another very hard book, because we're facing different zoning crises, different pressures from people in the land. One of them, for instance, which is not a difficult at all, is the Airbnb, which has moved in rather great quantities since the world, and that's a big thing. But we don't know how many there are who's coming. Maybe someone could address that, or at least put it in the same category as uh, uh, regular, regular activity. Many cities are doing that to protect themselves. And I live down in Peter County Square, uh, south of that. We're very close to each other. The more neighbors are brought suddenly, we don't have to do it. Thank you. Yes. Could I ask if we could have our speakers stand up? Oh, yeah, that's a great point. Yeah, if, if you, that's a great I'm hard of hearing. I really need to see it. Next. Yeah, the comment that, okay, let me repeat that comment. Uh, the quality of life, and particularly zoning as a controller, a way to mitigate and manage quality of life. Uh, concern is that the Airbnb or other trends that are happening nationally uh, could impact our quality of life, especially because we're a dense neighborhood. And while we may know our neighbors, we don't necessarily know the guests that are coming in to use their places. So perhaps zoning and um, maybe there's a way to use taxation, uh, maybe there's other tools that we could use. And the borough is a, a instrument, an instrument for managing the, the future changes like that. Is that fair? Right. Yeah, so in the future, if, if you have something, please stand up and that makes it easier to project. And I'll make sure I repeat because I know this is being recorded as well. So thank you. Are there other comments? I'd like to make a comment about, um, I, I feel that there's a sense that if you dissolve the borough, you wouldn't have any of these quality of life issues left. And I think over time, you see, We've lost many of the functions that the borough used to do. The most recent was garbage. We turned that over to the town. The town does police, education, public health. And I think that uh, we could still have a borough and still have a borough government that discussed matters less of a legal, a, a legal thrust and more of a community thrust. I think that there's a real dis disadvantage in having local planning and zoning because the office is rarely open. We don't have access to the GIS that the, that the town has. They have, they have planners, they have resources. You can go over there if you have a question on anything on the borough and get an answer. And I think that we're, it's, it's really a disadvantage that we have only a few hours a week and when you go in, we don't have anywhere near the technology that the town has, and yet we're paying for it at the town level. So I say that we don't have to just think of dissolution as being the end. I think we would just look at it in a different way. Yeah, I think, I, I think the orientation of services that we're delivering, you know, I think when uh, Jeff was talking in framing the borough, it was founded on the principle of providing fire protection at that time. But you think about 1830s, you know, I don't know too much about that history and what residents of the borough would have wanted at that time. Perhaps fire was the only issue. But today, what might the residents of the borough want? And are we providing, are, are the services that we're providing aligned with the values of the community? So I think, you know, that's, that's something that we haven't picked that and it's an interesting point. Is it, did, I, did I get that correct? Pretty much oh, so. <laughs> but, um, and remember that when, when the state of Connecticut, when the state of Connecticut is looking at um, the borough fire department, they don't think of it as a borough fire department, they talk about it as a fire district. And we do have other areas besides the borough that the, that the borough fire um, the, uh, covers. So we wouldn't be losing our fire department. It would just be a fire district. Yes. Could you give a quick uh, definition or explanation of what a borough is for the village? Uh, yeah. A, a borough is a form of government. 
a village is not a form of government. So if we want to, uh, uh, let's let's look at places within our own jurisdiction here. So um, within the town of Stonington, the town is a form of government. It is under uh, under the town um, versus the city format. So the town format typically has a board of selectmen or a town council. Uh, the city format typically is a city council with a mayor or a town manager. That's typically how those are arranged in Connecticut. Um, the villages, Mystic, Pawtucket, those are place names. They may have a zip code, they may not, they're not required to have them. They are just villages that don't have uh, services but might. So Mystic Village, in terms of government services, it is a fire district that covers two towns. So the fire districts in Groton and in Stonington. And then it has its own zip code, and that's it. It's a place name, it's on the map. Uh, Pawkatuck has a fire district, it's a place name, it has a postal zip code. Most recently, uh, it was issued a postal, it was like 2003, I think it got its own uh, zip code. Uh, but it doesn't have its own government beyond that. At one point, Pawkatuck and Mystic had their own zoning without being a borough. Uh, some other boroughs, uh, Danielson, uh, Jewett City, at one point had their own police force. But you don't need to be a borough to have a police corps force because Rod Long Point is not a borough and they have their own police force. So uh, fire districts are a separate form of government, they're not the town. So, if you, you know, the, the town I always hold it up in quotes because uh, I work for the first selectman, but the police department doesn't work for the first selectman, nor does the Board of Education. And then the fire departments are not part of the town government at all, governance at all. So do you know, if I'm working on a project, I have to work with four different fire marshals because there are four different jurisdictions that I might be working with. Or, so it's, it's not as simple as is it in or out. You have to understand what the, the responsibilities are. But does that you know, help you understand the borough versus village? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Well, it, you know, the, because the, the challenge is that the government structure in this state is um, is dispersed. We we uh, we have very uh, dispersed governance control, and uh, there are a lot of really small entities that have some authority over something, and that that makes it challenging to deliver services. Because you know, if I, you know, give an example, brief aside, somebody had asked, could we put white line stripes on North Main Street? so that it would be easier to drive at night. Now with LED lights, it's a little bit difficult to see the edge of the pavement. That took me four months to get an answer on that. The four months, the, the answer I got was no. <laughs> but it took, it took four months to get the answer because I had to go through all the different levels of governance that, and many of them weren't within the town's control. So, you know, it, it's these, the more that we start, you know, the, it's nice to have control of things, but it also adds to the cost of delivering services and the challenge of getting answers. Yes. So if we didn't, have, if the borough government, just stand, just stand. If, if the borough government didn't control, didn't have control of the fire department, didn't become a fire district instead, would the town have the same problem? Yes. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
was backed up uh, during that heavy rain about a week ago, is backed up. And, you know, Sue and Roger went down there with brakes and pulled out a ton of seaweed and got it flowing again. So they, it's, it's little stuff like that. Obviously, the town would, would plow, they would repair uh, roads, but we do have a little more control over the sort of the timeliness uh, of this sort of thing. And to get to the question of the fire department, yes, the, the, obviously if we uh, consolidated and the borough uh, government was dissolved in some form, the fire department would no longer be a municipal fire department, we'd have to form a fire district. But don't forget, that does not work for the town. As Jason said, each one of these fire districts is, is themselves a, an independent taxing authority. They do not report to anybody at the town. They do not report to anybody. Our fire department is the only one that reports <coughs> to a municipal elected official. Whether that makes a difference or not and how effective they are, I don't know. But, but it seems a little strange to me that you have a town with six different fire departments that don't report to anybody in the town. Except Who do they the, report to? The fire insurance. They, yeah, they report their own board of trustees or directors, and, and it's like a little corporation. How did that happen? It, happened, <laughs> it probably happened 150 years ago. And I, if, well, it happened in rural areas because uh, they needed some fire protection and there was no other system in place to do it. They started forming these things. Uh, and, and now here we are 150 or, or years later and they're still there. Now, obviously in cities and, and uh, even in towns like uh, what, Broughton or Waterford, th those are municipal departments, are they? Or some combination, Nick? Uh, city of Broughton. In, in Broughton, in, in city of Broughton, in, in Waterford, it's, it's uh, clo closer to, uh, it's different than something that there aren't fire districts, but they, they are, uh, Different private fire companies that have a contract with the town. Yeah, when we when we uh, you, uh, our fire department until a couple of years ago had three fire companies, uh, and one of the things we've done in the last couple of years was consolidate them into one company, uh, which is uh, in itself an independent, not for profit <coughs> corporation, but it but it has a contract with us. But the, when we had to consolidate those things, we found that two of the three were operating under state charters. And, and there was no formal relationship at all. I mean, if there was a fire, they could have all stayed home because they, they didn't owe anything to the borough. They were independent agencies that just by tradition were part of the borough fire department. So it seems to work and it's kind of funny to me. Well, one, one slight tiny wrinkle, we have six fire departments, but there are 11 fire districts in Stonington. So yeah. there are five districts that contract with another fire department. Yeah. Um, um, have any cost savings been uh, explored in consolidating? One, if, if we form, uh, if we dissolve the borough and form the fire district, you'd find that you'd be paying about half of what you're paying now in borough taxes just to keep them operating. Because they would see they'd be an independent taxing authority and you'd get a tax bill from the borough fire district instead of the tax bill you get from the borough government. So it wouldn't be like you'd, you'd save that entire enormous sum that you're paying for the borough. Yes, can I try to shed a little light what kind of a beast the borrow is. I'm Nick Temple, a borrow attorney. Uh, <coughs> if some of you are a little confused, you can take comfort that I've been practicing municipal law for 25 years and I'm, I'm still trying to figure <laughs> all, all this stuff out. But uh, I do think it, it may clarify to uh, explain that um, we have 50 states, and one of the states is you know, that formed a republic. Uh, the state of Connecticut is the font of, of all authority for these creatures uh, below it, these things, cities and towns. We have 169 municipalities in Connecticut uh, that are political subdivisions of the state of Connecticut. And they've been granted that authority by, by the state of Connecticut. We also have what was 20 some, 25, that once were 30, some, 30, 30 20, plus 26, yeah. 26 boroughs. Now it's down to eight, I think. But those boroughs 
are political subdivisions of the state of Connecticut. Unlike five or six, there's a whole panoply of, of entities, lake districts, um, beach associations, loads and loads of five or six. There's, there's statutes about what they call special districts, which perform a whole variety of functions. So, um, like I represent a fire district in Wyndham that is just a fire district. It funds, it collects money from a particular geographic area outside of what used to be Willimantic. They, they fund three different volunteer fire departments. They fund a little league. They do recreation. Uh, they fund the three different libraries. So, you know, fire districts um, can be, can do more than just fire but they're not political subdivisions. So when, when you look at all the, what, uh, until the 1950s, if Stonington or New Haven or anybody, any of the community, not any of the political subdivisions, they wanted to do anything, if they wanted to change how they functioned, they would have to run to Hartford and get a special act of the legislature to change this, the number of people on the warden and burgesses of, of the borough. In the 50s, the state, the state of Connecticut adopted what's called the Home Rule Act. They, the re legislature realized having these 169 plus the boroughs entities running to Hartford to, to try to govern things locally made no sense. So they adopted this global rule that said towns and boroughs can, can run their own thing. They can adopt charters and run things. And so now when you look at municipal statutes uh, about what these political subdivisions can do. It says towns, cities, and boroughs. So I think it's, in, it's important that even though there's only eight of them, that you understand that you know, boroughs are a political subdivision, a, a creature which is, has broader power to kind of rule, run the, the domain that they, that they geographically cover. Then five districts. It's just that, like the Wyndham, the, I represent the Wyndham First Taxing District. They do these things: recreation, uh, fire, and library. But aside from that, they have no other governmental authority. You know, unlike uh, they're not they're not really in interested in other other aspects. They do no zoning. Anyway, uh, so yes, we could uh, if we if you got rid of the borough by by consolidation. A fire district could be formed to, to perform fire services, but it, it wouldn't have the same autonomy and have the same responsibility about the overall life of the geographic area of the borough that the borough has not. And lastly, I'll just add one, one thing back on in front of your question. One thing that I think, just as an observer of the borough for uh, 60 plus years, um, as because one plus of being small, and I know it's gotten smaller, is that, a, that, that when you're small, like a thousand versus eighteen thousand or fifty thousand, you can be nimble and you can do things uh, and be innovative. For instance, my mother loved the fact that her property w was split between part of her property when we grew up on Elm Street was in the borough and part was in the town. She loved the fact that. Because a part of it was in the borough, she was able to get trash collection uh, from the borough. Because the, the, the borough did you know, curbside um, co collection and recycling long before the town did. And so that's an advantage of being, when you only have to get a smaller group to agree to something, you can be nimble and uh, innovative in a way that trying to get 18,000 people to do uh, is sometimes tough. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So is the borough Entirely autonomous and independent town, where there's some town or rules that uh, apply to the borough. Interesting, interesting question. Uh, it, it's a, it's. Oh, it's a oh sorry. Is the is the borough autonomous from the town? Um, in certain respects, it's independent of the town, but borough residents, because they're town residents as well, are subject to like a. The borough, I don't think, has a noise ordinance, right? Uh, and by the way, one of the things as a political subdivision, the borough can adopt ordinance. Five districts can't adopt ordinances. So, you know, there's how many? 30, a bunch of 30-ish or ordinances that, that deal with a whole range of activities about life in the borough. 
And so, uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> but the, the borough doesn't have, a, doesn't have a noise ordinance, so the people in the borough, who are residents of the borough, who are also residents of the town, have to abide by the town's uh, ordinance. That's in the absence of the borough. Yep. Uh, did, did you want to add something? Yes. One question I have. You're talking about expanding the borough. And how are you going to do that? Are we going to go to Mystic and say we're going to take part of you back in the borough? <laughs> Yeah, I say territorial expansion uh, could be challenging, uh, but, uh, and by the way, uh, I, I, what was the year of the last borough battle? I mean, it's, uh, 1914, yeah. Uh, I can't swear at the days again. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah. It, seem, it seems to me that um, by maintaining the borough, we have a political voice, and a political voice in any environment is better than no political voice. So to maintain the borough gives us a political voice at various levels within the things that we govern or within things that the town of Stonington might be considering that we would want to be, you know, have addressed. We have many unique elements of our life here in Stonington and unique needs compared to some other parts of the world. Not the borough, but of the town. And so to have the borough as a defined political entity seems to me to give us more strength, even though it's varied in terms of how it's applied, be it with or without the fire district or with or without the garbage or with or without other things, taxation, it gives us a form to exert some degree of not power, but, but uh, you know, a voice within a much larger community. I think that's to me that's very important. But, yes. So, so it would seem from the list that there's a number of things which would um, mean the borough is important to the people who are here. But I think we're forgetting the fundamental issue that Jeff raised, that unless we can probably find at least a dozen people here who are prepared to step up and become more than the purchase of the next election and prepared to be on planning and zoning, we don't have an option but to do some exercise to look at what is a hybrid type of model. And maybe it looks like what, what the options are. And you don't probably have to sort this out in, in a town meeting like this. Uh, but I think it's inevitable that some change needs to occur. And, and it will also be nice to have all the things on the list. You know, who, you know who's going to be Jeff's replacement? Or is Jeff going to do this until he uh, dies? And if you look at some of the previous great people who have been more than purchases, they've left burnt out because too many people in the town were poking finger at it. They were like, I didn't like that. Didn't do this, and, and that's not fair on on the fault because they're essentially faults. Um, so, so, and that's part of why the cost may not go down because Jeff is probably working for forty hours a week and getting paid every night for So, unfortunately, we're, we're substituting volunteers at a government level to do work, and we have to come up with a, some solution which maybe is a, you know, where we can maybe can leverage services from the town. But it would, it would be nice if we had still had some feeling of it. Of the Kevin, uh, when I was looking through the old um, the old minutes, one of my purposes was to try to identify all the wardens since day one. And there was one fellow, Cornelius Crandall, who was warden for 30 years. <laughs> and I do not intend to challenge him. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know why uh, Hockatuck and uh, Mystic dropped their uh, planning and zoning commissions? No, it was done in the, it, they were adopted in the uh, 70s and shortly thereafter they were disbanded. It was a very short-lived uh, term. Right. I'd just like to make the comment that more or less in response to the uh, previous uh, suggestion that uh, uh, our planning and zoning is probably a little substandard in that uh, you know, our, our, our planner is only has office hours uh, for a few hours a week. Uh, therefore, our planning and zoning doesn't really work that well. Um, on the contrary, uh, we have a very active commission, and the commission meets on a, on a regular basis, and it has a very small uh, domain to work with. And within that small domain, I've been on the, with the commission for about three or four years. Within that small domain, the issues are very voluminous and very complicated. And if we were to uh, collapse 
Park Commission into the uh, larger town, I can assure everybody that uh, any issues that they have with their particular property or their particular neighbors will get short shrift uh, having to deal with the uh, commission has to deal with the uh, population of uh, properties that are probably like, like 10 times, 15, 20 times larger than the world itself. Yeah, yes. I'm curious if you could ask everybody if they know what the positions are in the government, when the next election is, how much time it takes. Like, I personally think I don't know enough about it, and I've said I think we need like a job fair type of thing so everyone can understand what the positions are that we need to help with. So, I mean, well, that's, uh, you know, if, if, if you were interested in volunteering for the borough, where might you go to find out uh, whether, whether there's opportunities? Jeff. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, do you use the website? Do you use the borough's webpage at all? Is that something? Anybody use the borough's website, the webpage, to find out information about the borough government? How many people here have volunteered for borough government activities or have ever thought about it? Yeah. Anybody willing to do it? <laughs> yeah, okay, well, <laughs> I just remember when my dad was, he was on zoning, he was on stuff. Um, it was like great friends kind of going against each other. There were posters all over the place, and they enjoyed the competition. They enjoyed it. They enjoyed, you know, I'm going for this. I mean, honestly, I don't know enough about it, so I'm not going to name a, a position. But um, it gave you a feeling of a sense of, belonging and it was okay that you were running against your best friend because the job was still going to get filled. So I just think it would be nice if everyone... give a very quick summary. The, the Warden and Burgess positions are elected positions. They're two-year terms. The elections are in the odd years in May. Uh, they're there to differentiate them from the town so people don't confu get confused about what they're voting for. So the next election for all six Burgesses and for the Warden will be in May of next year. A, um, Connecticut is a state that basically, and maybe most of the states this way, the rules are set up so that the two major parties really run the show. So if anybody is interested in running for an office, you have to figure out who the committee chairman is for your particular party and approach that person and say you're interested in running for Warden or Burgess. And I'm sure they, they would be happy to, uh, to talk to you about it, as, as would I. The other positions, Planning, Zoning, Z, Zoning Board of Appeals, Harbor Management, those are all volunteer positions. They're all appointments by the Board of Board Members. And there are always, except for Harbor Management, because we have a lot of sailors here who love to get involved with Harbor Management. But Planning, Zoning, and ZBA always have openings. Hmm. <laughs> always have openings. And uh, I'll be happy to talk to anybody about that. You can send me an email. Uh, I'll give you my email. Want. It's not, actually all that information is on the borough website. Just send me an email and say you're interested, and then we can chat. And I can. Uh, I've become a regular at Noah's, and Nick and I meet there about once a week. And now I'm interviewing people for positions whenever they pop up, and I pay. So uh, if you if you think you might be interested, uh, contact me, and, and we'll meet and talk about it. Good evening. Uh, my name is My question is, I do care what goes on in the borough, and I'm interested to know what are, uh, I know this little chart says the population is going down, and even though I'm not here, I still care, and how can I participate or uh, uh, get involved, let's say, in uh, helping with 
with whatever the future vision is of this area because to this day, I will tell you all, the moment I set foot in this town, I fell in love with it. So you've done a wonderful job <laughs> to this point, and I'd like to see it continue. I think that's one of the challenges is how, because there are a large number of people who are part-time here and many of them have participated in the past, do participate now, would like to participate in the future. It's challenging because uh, planning and zoning meets every month and you know, you, we don't let people Skype in, at least not under the present charter. Maybe that's something that could change. But many of these positions do require boots on the ground, as you say. Uh, so, it, that's that's an area to work on. How can we involve people who don't live here full time? Yes. I just one comment. The stuff is is I'm not really a resident of the borough. As we talked about last time, this little triangle that I'm walking by. But I'm very interested in the borough because my team has been here for a very long time. Um, and the spirit itself, where is that going to change in the borough? One thing, and I don't have any idea how this cuts. I think you ought to be aware of what I would call social stratification. When I was young, and when my dad was born here over 100 years ago, the borough was a totally socially structured place. We had factory workers, we had fishermen, uh, we had people who came during the summer, uh, we had all levels of social and economic. Participation. It's it's really it's pretty pretty much not that way now. It's, it's a pretty much socially uh, homogeneous. Um, and I don't know what which way that cuts in terms of. Must be nice in terms of trying to deal with your local issues. Your your it simplifies the things you have to deal with. But nonetheless, I think it's important to be aware that's a change that's occurred in the borough over time. <clears throat> over the time since the, these structures were first put in place. And I just wanted to throw it out there. Maybe have a box on here for this year. Well, we're, we're getting to the 7 o'clock time, which is our herd adjourn time. Uh, before we get to that place, I did have one additional question that I wanted to poll the audience about. How many people here feel that doing a study, an alternatives assessment of the borough governance options uh, makes sense and that they would be supportive of that? Yeah, good, excellent. Yeah, and, you know, I think one of the things that we'd like to see as an outcome of this process is that uh, this report recommends to the, the uh, board that they undertake such a study. And I, I think one of the things we wanted to test were what, what were some of the other issues that the community residents felt supported the need for borough governance. So thank you for providing that, that input this evening. Um, what, what our next steps in this process is we intend to compile that tactical report of uh, ideas and uh, we'll be issuing the, the tactical report uh, in a draft format for people to comment on so it'll be available for public review and participation and uh, we believe that one, that one of those recommendations will be such that there's an alternative assessment done for borough governance and uh, just want it, it feels like there's a strong support for that here in this audience at, at least. So um, that's that's our game plan for that for this process is to issue that tactical report with the, with those elements in it and the various uh, opportunities for this community to explore to deal with some of the issues that came up. Um, we don't have a target date for when that report will be issued. We're hoping it'll be sometime in the middle of the fall. So uh, pay attention to the the communication tools that we've used in the past for these meetings because we'll be having another meeting for uh, the outcome of that process. We want to, before we finalize it, make sure that you've had a chance to review and continue to comment and participate. Uh, on behalf of the panel, the group, um, the people that uh, put the, the Borough Vision uh, organization together, thank you for coming this evening. Uh, appreciate that you gave us the time. Uh, thank you. Thank you.